read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners Hey, lady listeners, welcome, welcome. You're here for the second installment of um, New You Remind by Angela Marie Hart. And we're going to play that in just a little bit. But before then, we're going to talk about uh, how we love a stupid heroine. <laughs> we were actually talking about this between breaks. And um, I don't know, like, I, I normally... What is that? What do they call that trope? Too stupid to live. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Too, too stupid to live. You know? I don't know if people still do that. It, they, it, it's even abbreviated. Know. Yes. So like, and I get it. Like nobody wants a woman to be dumb. But in situations when it's like a dirty book, sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, what's happening? What is that? Too stupid to live doesn't bother. It annoys a lot of people. It has yeah. never bothered me. You have to be <laughs> really bad to get a, I mean, not to like a heroine. I give women a lot of leeway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. Like what's that but, in your pants? Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know what it is about it. I just love when they're just completely innocent. Like, I think that's one of the things that makes me love the book Last Hit so much by Jessica Clare and Jen Frederick because she's like kind of a recluse because her dad's like has that agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. So she has like no idea how the world works. Yeah. And he's like this Russian hitman that's like crazy about her. And now I want to write a taboo one and a real one. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll you know what that. I'm saying? Like, I want to write yeah. a quick taboo one, but I also mm-hmm. want to write, maybe they can be connected. Same world. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, the can girls knew each other. We're going to pull place. in all these contemporary readers to our taboo books. <laughs> what, what have we done? Who have we hurt? <laughs> but. You know, I was talking to Celia. Aaron over the weekend yeah. when I was seeing her and I was talking to her about some of the kinks and she's just like I just don't think I can write that it's like I just I can't get into the incestuous implied not implied so like, I don't know if really? I can write it yeah she's like it just freaks me out I, she's like I don't know it's just not my jam I, I just think it's interesting what clicks to people and what doesn't click for people. Yeah, and that surprises me that she's just like a hard no. I don't, hard, you can break the essay, whatever, out of yeah, somebody. Yeah. Like she's yeah. all down to write that. Yeah. I mean, she writes some dark, mm-hmm. hard erotic. Like dubious consent and all that. Yeah. She writes yeah, some dubious yeah. consent. That, she's like, hell yeah, I do that all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she's into that. She's written down. But not she's like written. implied incestuous. Yeah, yeah, where you don't know if they're because in the taboo mm-hmm. books we're leaving it very vague. That's up to yeah. your imagination. Mm-hmm. We don't say what you get to pick. Are. You said choose your own adventure. You it get really to pick is. what you want. It's wherever your mind takes mm-hmm. you that you, wherever you want to go. No judgment. So, you know, I do think that's one thing that I appreciate about writing with you is I don't. There are very few instances, and I'd have a hard time recalling them where we were like one of us was like no. No, that's what you know. What I will say, mm-hmm. I am never feel weird telling you a fucked up fantasy. Yeah, right. Yeah, like mm-hmm. you were like the one person that I would tell something fucked. I was like, I, <laughs> yeah, there's something wrong, and I wouldn't even hesitate, and I wouldn't mm-hmm. even be really embarrassed about it. I would like, yeah, never judge me. I literally just, just told you a fucked up one like ten minutes so, ago. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just think everybody likes er- different things. And I think some people don't realize how much other people do like things or yeah. it doesn't bother them. Yeah. It's just interesting what people are drawn to and not mm-hmm. drawn to. Well, you I'm glad know. I can be a, a safe space for you to talk about your kings. Because I feel like you're that way with me. Like, you're that for me. Like, I, I literally just told you <laughs> before we hit record. I was like, all right, so I masturbated to this the other day and it's really fucked up. <laughs> But I think you're going to like it. <laughs> yeah. And it was hot. But it's one of the, like, not everybody can appreciate that. But mm-hmm. I do think that that's 
you know, it's another reason that we write well yeah, together. She started talking about the, um, what are the people called? They're half horse, half people. Oh, the centaur, the minotaur. She's like, what if you have one of those? And it's like, you, she's got to milk him. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Mm, she's that like, that sounds hot to me. me. I'm like, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> that doesn't interest me. No, not in the least. That's like, what? Oh, God, a blowjob? No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, we've written 200 books. We've probably written four blowjobs. <laughs> That's so funny. You said like she's actually telling me a, like when a book she started and she's like, I'm going to make her put the cum in her mouth or something. I was like, eh. Ugh, <laughs> no. like, ew. I'm an immediately no. Immediately. I'm, like, I'm just like, meh. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it can be hot. Sometimes there can be sometimes really hot. Sometimes it, it can be hot. Like, oh shit. What was the one book I was talking about the other day? where like he comes in her mouth and then he's like open your mouth i want to see it and she mm -hmm. has to like show it to him oh my god what was that i was just talking about this on the podcast like a couple weeks ago because it was like this really sweet innocent book and i was like holy shit that kind of sounds hot we need to write that in a scene maybe i'll know, write that I've in a scene after since I you read it, it i'll write it since i, I know read it. after i read it i, I think like, i've heard it i think i've that's not, not the first time i've heard that before yeah i was but it's been a while about... since i have heard it yeah. Like I used to hear it more in the oh my BDSM God. My when it was bigger back in the day. Maybe so. And but it honestly, like, and just just full disclosure, it's just not something we write. I mean, it's women's fantasy. <laughs> like I, yeah. I feel like that's fair, right? I remember in um Christmas, speaking of Christmas, there's a forced Christmas book mm -hmm. where it's three guys and one girl. Remember, they steal her their secretary. They've been like waiting yes. to bang her all of them jack off on her oh my God, and then rub it that. into her stomach before fuck, they fuck her hot. they yes. all master it onto her oh stomach. my god how did you remember that book that's like 2008 <laughs> because i pulled them up like three or four nights ago when i was looking at the new taboo books coming out and i was just kind mm -hmm. of scrolling through what our old taboo stuff was yeah that i just that one came back to me Ones that always come back to me is that one, mm -hmm. the wicked one. Oh, taking what's wicked. Her. Because I, there was something about when he said, and I hate to say it because it's terrible to say this out loud. It's fucked up, mm -hmm. and it makes me mad. And I will fight with the school but about reality it. Reality is different than fantasy. Uh, yeah, um, you were asking for it. Oh yeah, she was though. She's wearing a little costume. <laughs> Like in real life, I'm like, I will fucking murder you. Say that. I yeah. dare you. But like yeah. in, the book, in like, real life, yes. And the wicked one, it's that way. It's so hot. And they the fuck one, up against that van. Like they're outside. He, no, he fucked her up against the outside of the bar. And remember, mm. he like walked out and broke the door handle so nobody could come out. Yes. And he fucked her up or he fucked her or ate her out up against the wall while the mm -hmm. other guy came around. Mm -hmm. And then he took her, the guy that drove around, took mm -hmm. her and put her in the back of the van so he could have his turn to get off. Why the other guy drove to the location. That's so hot. That was taking what's wicked. Mm -hmm. That's by and us. And we're talking about how hard our books are. <laughs> it's just been so long since we've but really it has. done no, the course. No, no, yeah. And the, yeah. I was just flipping mm -hmm. through. And I remember the one in the um, mm -hmm. the truck driver guy. Oh, my God, Mel. That one was nasty. You know why that one is nasty? Because that first scene when he was like, show me your panties was reminiscent of that movie oh with Reese Witherspoon where she's hitchhiking. Oh shit. And Keeper yeah. Sutherland. He mm -hmm. comes off as a nice guy. At first. It's like the hitchhiker. No, yeah. Not something, like the hitchhiker? That. something like that. And yeah. Where he's just like a nice guy, but then he ends and up all of a sudden yeah. he's not. Mm -hmm. It kind of, it kind of came from that. So the book I was talking about love on the brain by Allie Hazelwood that's the one where it's like it's a, it's like a contemporary mm -hmm. like you know it's a great book it that came out of nowhere when he like came in her mouth and he was like show it to me and i was like hold up <laughs> this like beautiful romance just got fucked <laughs> this is awesome but like i was like five stars five star immediate five stars <laughs> oh, but God. yeah that was that was so hot but yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, it's weird being able, I, I don't know, maybe it's not weird. Maybe everybody has that one person that they can tell like nasty fantasies to, but I just don't think it's that common, <laughs> but maybe it's because we write together and there really is no subject that's 
off limits because for us, it's like, well, does it turn you on? If it's not turning you on, it's not good. Let's rethink this. Like, you know, we wrote a taboo book recently, the one milked, Mm -hmm. what is it called? Milky. Um, Oh my God. I just sweet milky or milky sweet. No, it's milky Milky secret. That was it. Milky secret. And so it was like, it's like the lactation porn. Mm -hmm. And that is like, I see it everywhere now. And I'm like, that is so hot. But you were like, I just don't get it. Yeah. It's, it's not, like, a not a huge, it's not a huge to me, turn-off. but at the same time, you were really into it, but I could roll in other tropes. Like that book yes. turned me on still yeah. mm-hmm. because it rolled in other tropes came into yeah, play. Cause it was like a, it was like a breeding, but no, it wasn't breeding. It was like, take care oh, it was the uncle it was like the like, guardian ward kind yeah of he's been like yeah. nurturing mm-hmm. her to grow up and yeah waiting yeah and... he's been waiting to take her so yeah there's like a lot of other things that go with it and it's also like his kinky desire to like specifically her mm-hmm. i think that's one thing you know i was talking with somebody about this the other day i don't remember who i was talking having this conversation but we were talking about like really narrowed specific things in romance that you like really really narrowed specifics where it's like she like like he has a breastfeeding kink Mm -hmm. and she's the only one that can give him that so it's like it's like Like if there's something really specific about the heroine i like when yeah they only like have that kink towards that person only yeah. that person can mm-hmm. fulfill it for them. That's only it's only ever been brought out from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's the nobody else to mark you or the yeah. to something. Mm-hmm. Or it's like, oh my god, I have to breed her immediately. Yeah, I have to take this to a different level. She's mm-hmm. different. Yeah, yeah. Where it's yeah, I, I just love that. So, oh, so those are our taboo books we've got coming out soon. So you're gonna love them. Just be on the lookout for them. And we have lots of Christmas books still to come. We have, if you're following along on social media, we have um, the first one was Brother's Best Enemy. The second one is The Cozy Agreement. Um, Those are both out right now. The next one up is um, The uh, Blackmailed by the Grump, which I love that title. It's just so cute. Um, Blackmailed by the Grump. And then we also have one that's coming to the podcast in two weeks. Um, Secret baby. Secret, oh, yeah. Stalked by the secret baby. <laughs> How, like, I can literally picture a baby stalking somebody. Baby. I know. It's so ridiculous. Stalked by the secret baby. Stalking the secret baby. Mm-hmm. And then um, we have the last one in that, the fifth book, is um, the one we're actually working on right now. So that'll be out um, before Christmas. It's called Forbidden Stranger. So make sure you check all those out. And then um, our taboo books. And then we have new print books that are coming. They're super exciting. We have like a holiday print book. We have uh, the Andorra royalty print books. And then we have the princesses in print. So if you're looking to do that for Christmas, here you go. Yeah, I'm going to put those books, those paperbacks up. Mm-hmm. They'll be in the show notes if you guys want to yeah. click that set. All the links to all the things. All right. So I got an email the other day from an author. And I didn't, um, I didn't ask her for permission to read this. So I'll leave off her name. But I do want to write this in general, or I do want to read this because in general, I think it's a fair question um, Mm -hmm. that a lot of authors might want to ask us. So she says, hey, Leah, I hope it's okay to reach out. I wanted to see if I could ask some advice regarding short romance books and how to gain traction and become profitable. I have a pen name for my short books. I created a pen name because, well, there's some crossover. I didn't want to connect to my to connecting my smut to my full length series. Anyways, um, the pen name has done okay. It's not terrific, but it's done good. I'd like to start releasing two to three books a month and doing rapid releases. However, I'm not sure how marketable, how to market these books, where to find readers of short romances. When writing, do I need to be sure there's a clear trope? I want this pen name to succeed. Um, And then she said, I've tried um, joining author collabs, Facebook ads, but none of the books seems seems to be sticky enough. If you don't feel comfortable sharing anything, I totally understand. I just know I'm a lover of Alexa Riley books and wanted to reach out because I've seen y'all's success and was hoping you might have some might have some advice. So this is how I approach this email and how, you know, if you're an author and you're listening or you're an aspiring author and you're listening, we do not gatekeep 
the way to do this. If you ask me a question, I'll answer you. A hundred percent. And I told her this in the email. I was like, I am not holding secrets. If, you know, we had so many wonderful people help us in the beginning and uh, to, to just pay that forward is it's why we're here. I feel like the die the group of people we're writing for write, read a lot of books a week. Mm-hmm. They read like seven books a week, eight, nine books a week. Some people over the weekend mm-hmm. devour a bunch. There's room at the table for a lot of fucking people. Everybody. Absolutely. So, and, and even if you're an aspiring author and you think like, well, people are already writing the kind of books I would want to write. It doesn't matter. Mm-mm. You as a reader should know if I read a book like this and I love it, I want 10 more books like that. Yes, I am definitely, I'm that person. I will yep. read the same thing over and over yep. and over again. Did Just we like not? I watch the same shows over and over again. Absolutely. And I want the same types of things. Even if I want it from different authors, each author is going to give me the same thing a different way, but I still mm-hmm. want the same thing. Yeah. You know, and we just talked about this before. I sent you a link to a book and I said, this book has everything I want. Tell me if you would get it. Because it's like, I want to make sure like, okay, am I seeing all the things? Am I checking? Mm -hmm. Is this going to check all my boxes? Because you know how I am and I know how you are. So it's like between us, we're going to get it. But, um, but it's one of those things too. Like if you like it, somebody out there is going to like it. So don't let that discourage you. But I started with, you know, we're not gatekeeping here. If you want to know something about publishing, about how to do it and how to be successful, I will share with you everything I have. But I did tell her, I said, I just want to let you know up front, we're not on Amazon anymore. So our approach is a little bit different. And we have also been writing since 2013. So, you know, this, it's, it's different than, you know, it's different now than it was then. We don't really, we don't do Facebook ads. We don't really do, um, like, we have a newsletter swap we're doing right now. This is the first one we've done. At maybe ever where it's like a consistent newsletter swap every month. I thought that, have we done that before? No, but it was a free book and it was a big group. Yeah. So. And they were, and the people that asked us to do it, they were really nice about it. And mm-hmm. it was just like, okay, but you know, we don't normally do like author swaps and stuff. I told her, I said, you know, we've been lucky and very, very fortunate that we've built a fan base that has stuck with us because we've been consistent, not only in releases, but also in the way we write our books. You know, and that's kind of what we talked about earlier, where it's like we kind of write the same stories over and over and over, but in different ways and fun ways. And I said, if it's not fun for you, you're not going to enjoy it. You're going to burn out. I always wonder if I'm going to plagiarize myself on accident. <laughs> Have you ever thought that? <laughs> no, I mean, maybe, yeah. Like saying <laughs> phrases over and over, yes. Yeah, phrases. Yeah, like I say phrases. separate mm-hmm. phrases. I don't think a whole yeah. scene, but I'm like, like mm-hmm. I probably said this. And th- yes. I don't know. I've probably the said I- these ex- exact way of I love you before, yes. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, and I just I tried to explain to her, too, that, you know, she writes dark romances. And I said, if you're in this to make money, and there is absolutely no shade in that. People get into this all the time to make money. But if you don't enjoy what you do, you will burn out so fucking fast. Especially if you're trying to release short novellas and you're trying to do more than two a month. And I believe that the readers, because I didn't think this at first, I believe the readers can feel when an author doesn't like what they're writing. Absolutely. And when you, that's when you're reading a book and you're like, this is hitting all my mm-hmm. spots, but something's not clicking. Yeah, and like, that's mm-hmm. when I think it's the author doesn't like what they're writing. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I could definitely see that because I've read books where I'm like, it, it sh- this should be everything I want. Is it gonna, what's going on, you know? So I said this and I was like, you know, if you love dark romance, keep writing that. But dark romance doesn't appeal to a broader group of people. You know, if you're in this to make money, then you've got to think about right, who's your audience? Who's your target audience? You know, we've thrown so much money into ads and stuff. And it's just, it, it, I don't know how people make money in it. I don't know. Some people are really great at it and make and are really successful. I don't understand it. I don't know. But so, I, you know, I, I tried to give the best advice I could on that, on her email. And I just wrote back, you know, it, be consistent. Try to appeal to a large audience. Write the things that make you happy and stick with the same price 
in the same length of books. Mm -hmm. Cause I feel like that's a big, you know, uh, for someone, if it's like, okay, well, I know how long that book's going to be. And if they're consistent in their releases, I know they've probably had a couple of releases out since their last book. So let me go check that, you know, and I know about how long it's going to take me to read it. Yeah. I think that being consistent, like I would always see the Casey meant around. Yeah. And it was like, I kept seeing it and I kept seeing different covers and I kept seeing, and then I finally jumped in. I was like, oh shit. And then there was mm -hmm. a whole bunch to read. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you just start seeing it. You're seeing other people mm -hmm. talking about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I see more things than anything. Yeah. Is people talking about it in groups and stuff. Yeah. It's like, you mean with like consistency and stuff? No, I mean like finding books is when other people are talking about it. Other yes. readers. Yeah, Generally. I can say that. Yeah, I can see that. Well, you know, and I think that has to do a lot with consistency as an author. Yeah. Because, you know, like if you just, it's like Jessa Dean, you know, it was like, you know, all of a sudden we, you discovered her books and you love them. And thankfully she had a whole backlog for you yeah. to go read through, you know, because it was like exactly what you were looking for. But again, most of her books are around the same price point, around the same page length. They're kind of all in the same sort of, you know, written the same way with different tropes. Same vein. Mm -hmm. And I said, another good thing I say is to really trope your titles so that people kind of know what they're getting right away Yeah. when they get the title of your book. I love when people do that, when they're like, you know, this, this one I looked up today, the, the mistletoe motive. I haven't read it yet, but I looked it up because I was like, it's a mystery. And it says it's a holiday novella. I was like, it's holiday. It's novella. I was like, come at me. And then mm -hmm. you found audio on Kobo. And I was like, this is all grumpy of the things hero, like. cheery heroine. Yep. Yep. Exactly. It's enemies to lovers. Like there's an ex who's obsessed with her. I was like, I like when the ex is obsessed with the girl. Yes, me too. I'm like, give me some other man drama. I don't need the other woman drama. The other man shit I love. That's another one. That's another little tiny detail sprinkled into a book I love. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to do because we don't like to write. Sometimes we'll do it, but we don't write a ton of women in bad light. No, and I think the more we write, the less and less and less we do it. Where we, we where hardly ever we now. I mean, maybe we have before in the past, but I would say it's it's so much more or less now that there's a even a bitchy woman. You know, yeah, every now and then you have to have someone who's an asshole because yeah, there are and it assholes. happens to be a woman <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> but generally, we try not to. But there mm -hmm. is like in this last troping one, I know that one girl was an asshole, but she's yeah, not even she's really in the lawyer. Donna. Yes. <laughs> yep. Donna. <laughs> One of my best friends was named Donna. What's up, girl? <laughs> so I don't know. I got that email and I just wanted to say out loud, if you're listening and, you know, those are your own thoughts too. If you're writing and you're like, how do I get my book to stick? How do I get it to stay? I really d don't have the answer. If there was a magic formula, people would do it that I would I would seek yeah. that out, but there's just some things just hit and I can never tell you why. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I can see a cover and I'm like, that's why. So there's like, you know, you'll see, you know, for, for just for calling stuff out. Um, if you go on Amazon and you look on the top 20, you'll see several of the same authors that are up there all the time. And you're like, how, how do they do that? Um, one of the authors I see a lot there, Lucy score. Like she, she is organic as shit. Yes. She's a fantastic writer. She has like a hundred thousand newsletter subscribers because she's cultivated this over years of it and people loving her books. I've never even seen an ad, but I no. know of her. No. People read her. Like I mm -hmm. see, cause I see some of the books up in the top 20 and I'm like, mm -hmm. I've never seen a person talk about this person in my life. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is going on? And mm -hmm. I think those are like crazy Facebook ad spends. Crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We know like um, Megan Quinn, who we've had on the podcast in the past. Um, she actually said that um, at a, like she had like a, this author discussion thing. She talked about, I mean, it was like tens of thousands of dollars she spent on ads, you know, and you see her books up there. I mean, and, and I don't know, like, you know, and there's, there's things that she said publicly that I'm just like, oh my God, I can't, I can't imagine mm -hmm. spending that much money on ads. But yeah. for some authors, 
that's what works for them. And if you go to Amazon Top 20, Megan Quinn's books are up there. Yeah. You know, Colleen Hoover's books are up there. And I don't see ads for those. But again, that's like, you know, she's. I see to... Hoover ads everywhere. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't see the ads, but I see people talking about them and stuff because they're, they're trendy right now, you know? Yeah, they're super trendy. Yeah. But they're I always... super trendy. So people talk about them and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, with Lucy Score, personally, you know, I've read Megan Quinn and Colleen Hoover. With Lucy Score, to me, her writings it's fantastic. I love every book her, I've ever read from her. I've loved. She, rem- she is, like, one of the most organic, just naturally wasn't mm-hmm. even, it didn't even feel like she had to try. People just mm-hmm. latched on. I feel it. like that's, like, Mariana Zapata. Yes, I, I was like thinking of her, yep. was, but I uh-huh. never remembered how to say her name. Yeah, like, yeah. It reminds me of her. <laughs> Very much like that. Yeah, I feel like that's the same way. So, like I said, it, there's no magic way for one person to succeed. And even of the people that we've just named, some of them write really long books. Mariana Zapata, She'll write a 700 page book and not blink. And, you know, and, and Lucy score has, does have shorter ones. So like you just, there, there's no run, right. One right way to do it. You just have to do what makes you happy. But this author in particular that emailed was ask, asking about short rapid release novellas. And to, for me, that comes with time and being consistent and building a fan base. And for yeah. us, we were very fortunate to do that. Which is why sometimes, I think our books are successful. Sometimes I think some can come too fast, too mm-hmm. many, too much. I do think that. Mm-hmm. Like, you need a second. Like, now that I'm all cut up and Jessa Dean, as much as I want a book out, like, ever, I was like, can I get another one? Mm-hmm. There's a buildup yeah. of excitement. Yeah. And when it finally mm-hmm. drops, you're like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. As to where when you're flooded sometimes, mm-hmm. it's not as, I don't know. It doesn't like, feel like there's this pressing need to get it now. Danny Watts like that to mm-hmm. me because she's not always releasing. And I'm mm-hmm. like, this, pr- yes, a pressing need to even pre order. Because mm-hmm. you're and like, I don't want to forget. I don't, don't want to miss it. This is a limited time thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I can see that. That's why I think there's so many different ways that people operate and why Mm -hmm. they pre order, why they don't pre order, why Mm -hmm. they gravitate to this or that. Mm -hmm. It's all a mess. Nobody has the perfect formula. That's why there's always seminars. People, yeah, because people are trying to try different things. So, you know, one of the things I go back to like my mystery writer, Angela Marsons, that I love so much that I'm on book 18 in the series. You know, she publishes like three or four books a year, but the second I get that newsletter, I'm on it. Because she doesn't have, because I love it, it's exactly what I want. It's going to hit every fucking time. And I know she doesn't release very often. If she released two books a month, I probably wouldn't love her as much, you know? Because she does leave me wanting more. Mm -hmm. You know, with us, I can see why we might not be for some people. Because it's like that. We just, we've got so many books, they don't even know where to begin. Or they stop reading for two months and they're like, well, I'm, I can't catch up now. You know, <laughs> like I get, I know what that feeling's like, but for other people, it's like, oh no, I know no matter what, I'm going to have an Alexa Riley book in my back pocket. I can yeah. go read this other thing and I can come back and I can get one of these real quick. Mm-hmm. And I get that. Cause I'm like, I'm that way with some authors too. So, you know, did I know that yeah. little quick fix is waiting between shitty books <laughs> and then I'm like damn it this is terrible I mean sometimes I <laughs> do like songs. I'll be like what do I want tonight and I'll be mm-hmm. like okay that's gonna be you know this author mm-hmm. I'm gonna go see if they've released something or that's uh, more of a, this author. I'm definitely more of a mood reader than mm-hmm. I used to be I am yeah because now reader. it's like I know the feeling I want to get when I read and I'm like which feeling is that tonight it's like Dr. Yeah. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But, I mean, yeah. I always read 80% of Sam Crescent's book. Mm-hmm. But I have to be in the mood to read her because I know she's going to mm-hmm. aggravate me. Yep. But I'm drawn to her <laughs> aggravation. She's the only one that's allowed to aggravate me. Mm-hmm. I like know she's going <laughs> to aggravate me, but I want it. It's so weird. I don't know how she gets away with shit. She gets away Do you with read Jordan me. Silver anymore? No. No. Mm-hmm. Well, she just hasn't released as much. Remember, she went like I remember she went a little crazy mm-hmm. she on some of, author. Yeah, she went a little. She went a little wild there for a minute. But I mean, I'm not sure. Surprise! Her books were some of the wildest shit. <laughs> I know it was life. like if you want some out there fucked up shit. But that's that actually a-, a great 
example of being oversaturated. I remember being oversaturated with her at one really? point. And yeah. now she's like gone, barely releases mm-hmm. anything here mm-hmm. and there. But at one point, yes, it was very like the books were getting too long mm-hmm. and very redundant. I back, mm-hmm. In fact, her last book that she just released, that's all it says. Yeah. Is that it was really redundant. Like the book bio mm-hmm. sounded good, but they were like, this could have mm-hmm. been cut in half. It We are repeating everything. Yeah. And maybe that's like one thing that we've gotten good at too. When we write with each other, it sort of like keeps us from doing that, from being you cut me overly off. redundant. Yeah. <laughs> I know you can. Even like last night I was struggling. Yeah. I said mm-hmm. it in my note. I was like, you might like in my head, I can't think mm-hmm. of how to cut this off, but you might. You're like, I could it. probably use another chapter. I'm like, no, it does not. You know, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I, no, you always know when to cut it and I can't mm-hmm. cut it as quickly. <laughs> well, and it's like, and I get it because your mind is going and you're like, well, what about this? And what about this? And it's like, no, no, no. We're on to the next. Save that for the next book. No, nope. no, you're very good Story about theory. driving me back because I'll start yeah. to go like over here, and over there. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But you know, I, th- I think that's one thing too. Like you know, writing things that in you know knowing each other the way we do and the kinks and stuff that we like, I think it also keeps us enjoying what we write. So I, know, but I know that's got to be really hard writing by yourself. And I will say this: I believe there is a finesse to writing 20,000 to 25,000 word books. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to very quickly build a scene and put in, you get, Mm -hmm. and you know, you need to hit like boom, 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 hit Mm -hmm. this, this, this of who they are and go. And you really got to start rolling, but you've got to make sure you include these small details about it Mm because it can't be no details. I mean, it is, Mm -hmm. when we first started, I wouldn't have thought there's things I was like, oh no, it's just, but I realized as I read more and I read other authors, there is a finesse to writing short books and making yeah. sure you do certain things. Mm-hmm. Being able to hit your targets and move forward. Yeah. That's the big thing where it's like in a, in a short novella, it's being able to have forward progress while you're hitting those beats mm-hmm. because it's like, otherwise you're just in a room and things are happening and then it's over. Yeah, you're like, how am I already at 20? Mm-hmm. That's how you keep me moving. I don't know. I, I need somebody to track me along. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, and we're going. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll spend, we'll be on this one day, a whole book. No, <laughs> no. I'm like, we got to get an A to B. Let's move it. We got places to go. Yeah. So, so that was, again, that was just my advice I wanted to shout out. And if you ever have any questions, please feel free to email us. You can send me something at readmeromance at gmail.com. I am always happy to share my knowledge, although it may not be helpful, as you have just listened. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Angela Marie Hart. We have the second installment of New Your Mind. And I just wanted to go through and remind you guys of a couple of things. Um, she has a extra bonus scene from this on her website, AngelaMarieHart.com. We are going to have the link down in the show notes. So if you want extra from what you're listening to today, go check it out there. And the ending or the uh, the the sexy scene on there is a choose your own adventure. So it can be as tame or as hot as you want. You can pick which one you want to read, which I just adore. Um, she's also doing a second bonus novella that focuses on the best friend in this story, Hope, who is the one that's out of town and it's her brother that's there. Um, and it's her love life and that will be in the newsletter. So she says that she mentions the Lex O'Reilly in it. So it's, I got to hear that. I got to know what happens now. Um, she's also a, the founder and hostess of YouTube's first cozy mystery book club. Um, so make sure you check that out. She is doing a holiday extravaganza right now. So that's from December 1st to December 12th. Um, it's 12 days of cozies, which is just the cutest thing ever. And um, she is doing, uh, during that time, she's doing a daily uh, email that has bookish content in it that's unique to the newsletter. And when you open it up, you're automatically entered into a giveaway. So also make sure you enter this week's giveaway, which is like, there's a bunch of different things you can win. One of the big ones is a huge gift basket that's got all kinds of bookish stuff in it with like mugs and candles and and stickers and pens. And it's just, I, I want to keep it so bad. <laughs> so make well, sure you check all that out. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll pick you. Maybe, maybe you Maybe you won't. <laughs> <laughs> but make sure you enter and uh, everything's down in the show notes. All right. Let's send them in. Let's do it. See you guys on the other side. Chapter three. Natalie. 
Turning off the shower, I pause. What was that? I pull back the shower curtain like that's the barrier muffling the noise. The only sound I hear is a few water droplets hitting the drain by my big toe. Maybe it's just an old house being old. I wait, half expecting someone to knock on the bathroom door. Nope. I might just be too used to people being around. This is the first time I've had a bathroom all to myself in far too long. I actually rinsed and repeated, washing the conditioner completely out of my hair and shaved above the knee. With my family running around 24-7, I've barely shaven my ankles. I was starting to look like a bear cub. Now I feel clean and refreshed. Originally, I was going to immediately buckle down and get to work, but a leisurely shower without my sisters and extended family around was too tempting to pass up. While I'm not as vain as my youngest sister, who camps out in the bathroom straightening her hair every morning before contouring every inch of her face, some privacy would be nice. Stepping out of the bathtub, I grab the towel Hope left for me. She must have tossed all the other towels in the wash, leaving one just for me. It's the only towel in the bathroom, aside from the tiny one next to the faucet. As I unfold the towel, I half attempt to listen for the potential noise. Still nothing. Clearly, I'm more imaginative than I give myself credit for. Maybe I've been watching too much Lifetime with my mother. My attention shifts to the towel. It's Christmas-themed. Snoopy and his faithful companion Woodstock are decorating a tree next to the classic red doghouse. Snoopy's home is outlined in colorful Christmas lights and wrapped presents line the inside. It would be cute if the towel were a foot longer and wider. It's perfect for the holiday season, just not practical. Water droplets from my hair continue to travel from my neck all the way down to the balls of my feet. I run the towel all over my body, but it isn't great for absorption. I'm mostly just shifting the water from one spot on my body to another. Another shiver works its way down my spine. No way am I catching a cold from taking a shower. I try to wrap the towel around my chest, but fail miserably. The towel Hope left me is clearly not meant to be that kind of bath towel. The two ends barely meet above my breasts, leaving the entire left side of my body exposed. I'm not even that top-heavy. I'm a solid C cup. Goodness, any woman with double Ds wouldn't even get the two ends of the towel to meet. Snoopy and Woodstock might look happy in the snow, but I'm not feeling the same. Another shiver racks my frame. Yikes. The winter weather has seeped into the house. My nipples harden in the cold air, and the end of my nose tingles like a sneeze isn't far off. I can't help but shiver again. I pause. Why am I trying so hard to get the towel to stretch? There isn't anyone around. I know what I look like naked. All I have to do is dart back into Hope's room and use a blanket or something to dry my hair. It's not a big deal. I really need a good night's sleep. No amount of caffeine is making me think straight. Sleep. I need sleep. I'll get to work on things tomorrow when I'm not a half-brained zombie. A burst of cold air hits me the moment I open the bathroom door. Jeez, winter in New England is no joke. I thought the bathroom was getting cold. The hallway is way worse. Wow. As soon as I'm dry, I need to turn the heat up. Oh. My. God. All of the blood rushes from my extremities to my face. I don't need a mirror to know I'm beet red. I clutch the towel closer to my chest, knowing it's not making a millimeter of difference. Clark freaking Miller is standing five feet away from my nearly naked self. This 
cannot be happening. Snoopy's head is the only thing between my breasts and Clark's gaze. I slowly and deliberately blink, hoping that I'm just in a daydream of a love fog. His house inspired a mirage. That's it. That has to be it. Clark Miller cannot see me standing here like a wet rat. No, no, no. Opening my eyes, he's still standing there, shirtless. This is the part where a normal person would pinch themselves to see if this was a dream or reality. Obviously, I'm not a normal person, and I'm not taking that chance. Pinching myself would involve removing a hand from my towel. Even in my weirdest and wildest dreams, he is not seeing me naked because of a towel mishap. It's usually because he wants me so much. He rips whatever baby doll nightie I'm wearing to shreds. Then I'm forced to wake up because someone makes noise. As I open my mouth to speak, I realize I'm not the only one showing skin. This has to be a waking dream. Those are real, right? Because Clark's delectable body is very, very visible. My eyes roam over his shirtless form, taking each groove in. No romance novel book cover could compete with this shirtless god of a man. My mouth waters at the ripples of his abdomen. You could grate cheese on those bad boys. I didn't know stomachs like that existed outside of Marvel movies. The hair on his chest looks darker than his usual five o'clock scruff, enticingly thick around his pectorals. My eyes are drawn there and can't seem to leave the magnificent man before me. Some strands of hair are long enough to curl around his lightly colored nipples before sensually leading down to the waistband of his pants. He undid his belt, letting those jeans hang off the definitive V of his hips. I can't help but ogle him. If my nipples weren't hard from the cold air before, they could cut diamonds now. Whenever I'm nervous, I fiddle with my locket. I can't, though. My hands are too busy holding the too small towel in place. Clark's gorgeous green eyes are wide and focused on the place where the towel I'm holding drapes open to show skin. Oh, no. It's not just skin. It's my skin. He's not just looking at a nearly naked woman. I'm that nearly naked woman. He's transfixed by me. I've wanted his eyes on me so many times. But in all of my fantasies, I've been fully clothed. He hasn't always been. But I've dreamt of everything from ball gowns to sexy lingerie. I've never just walked up to him naked. I've mentally undressed him more times than I can remember. But I've always had clothes on. And no matter how cute they look in their Christmas hats, Snoopy and Woodstock never made an appearance in my dreams. This isn't one of my fantasies. Clark can probably see my pebbled breasts. I look down at myself and realize a Christmas bulb is etched directly over my left breast, perfectly outlining it and drawing attention to the point. This is the awkwardness that only happens to me and movie sidekicks who are purely on screen for the comic relief. Realizing this is no dream, I manage to squeak out a barely audible, Hi! Clark, did I fall and bash my head on the snow-covered walkway? Or is Natalie Davis standing in my parents' house, wet, and naked. Water droplets fall from her chocolate locks to her sexy-as-fuck collarbone. I want to push her hair back and lick those droplets right from the source. 
lovingly caressing that tanned skin. Eyeing her pert breasts and toned legs, my thoughts get dirtier. Just as my brain gets ready for a round of nothing but sheer explicitness featuring this goddess, I pause. Her delicate hands have a slight tremor, and that all-over body shiver isn't because she's so hot and bothered by my presence she can't stand it. She's freezing. Natalie's soft voice brings me back to earth. One word from her is all it takes. Her gentle, hi, brings me back to reality. Even though my body is strung tighter than a bow, I manage to turn around. Instead of looking at a towel-wrapped Natalie, I see my sister's old art project on the wall. I'm sorry, Nat, I was just surprised to see you. A sharp intake of breath behind me shatters the calm I'm attempting to project. Uh, Not that I saw you. Uh, Of course I saw you. I I just didn't see all of you. I, I know what you meant, she interrupts, putting me out of my misery. Softly, she adds, I didn't expect to see you either. I look down at myself and realize she's not the only one showing skin. Rolling my shoulders forward, I think about doing some crunches or push-ups to really give her something to look at. I could always strip down to nothing and see if she takes what I'm offering. She in her Christmas towel and me in nothing but a red bow tied around my... What are you doing here? She asks, interrupting my thoughts. I wanted to surprise everyone. She lets out an abrupt giggle that turns into an easy laugh. (laughs) I think you accomplished that. The tension between us eases a bit. I relax my shoulders and stand taller. Even though we're both showing skin, I'm not ready for this interaction to end. What are you doing here? Hope went into the city for the long weekend. She said I could stay here and make a dent in the never-ending to-do list so that I didn't have to deal with my overcrowded house. Natalie pauses. I guess I can leave. I don't want to intrude. Without thinking, I turn back around to face her. No. Natalie jumps at my abruptness, causing her towel to fall open for the most amazing milliseconds of my life. You can stay here. I'd never ask you to leave. Her cheeks go bright pink. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Her brown eyes glance at the floor. I think I should go put some clothes on. I nod. Right. Me too. Wait, no, I'm not. I'm taking my pants off. Natalie's eyes snap to mine. I was going to take a shower. Lamely, I add. I don't usually do that with clothes on. Natalie looks down at her chest. Clearly, neither do I. I can't help myself. I look at her again. No, I guess you don't. Her face goes an even darker shade of pink. I know I embarrassed her, but she looks good like this. In fact, she'd look even better without the towel. I manage to keep that thought to myself. I take a step to my left as Natalie takes a step to her right. We remain right in front of each other. If this was a dance, we'd be perfectly in sync. From the outside, this might look like a goof, but somehow being in front of her feels right. I'm not meant to step around Natalie. If her blush could deepen, it would. I stand still as she walks around me towards Hope's room. I know I shouldn't, but I watch her walk away. If she's nearby, my eyes go to her. We could be in a sold-out stadium and I'd still be able to find her. As Natalie turns the doorknob, she coyly looks over her shoulder back at me. Caught you, I think. She wanted a second look, too. Hurriedly, she enters the room and closes the door behind her. Somehow, that rectangular block of wood doesn't feel like enough of a barrier.
All my reasons for never making a move seem trivial. I'm 19. She's 18. Hope isn't around. Even if she was here, she has her own life. Hope and Natalie are still friends, but they aren't as reliant on each other as they once were. This is my chance to make Natalie Davis fall in love with me. I'm not going to let this opportunity slip through my fingers. I've waited long enough. Chapter 4 Natalie I collapse on the bed, allowing the towel to fall open. What just happened? My hair is still wet and in need of some serious brushing. Water droplets cling to me for life, but I hide under the covers as if that will change the last five minutes. Clark looks good. No, not good. Amazing. The last time I saw him shirtless, we were at a barbecue two years ago. There were muscles. But now, wow, he's clearly been at the gym since then. Hell, everyone at the gym probably knows his name. You don't look like that and not end up on a first-name basis with the entire gym staff. Holy hotness. The problem is, he's not just GQ model material. He's the sweetest man I've ever known. How can I sleep under the same roof as him? I won't get a minute of peace. I can already feel my heartbeat in my throat. Clark makes me ridiculously happy and content, while also making my pulse race. I should just put on some clothes and go home. That's it. That is what I will do. Usually, I love the snow. I could watch it for hours with a smile on my face and hot chocolate in my hands. Lorelai Gilmore has nothing on my love of winter. Right now, each snowflake feels like a tiny dam being built around the Miller house, keeping me inside. I truly am stuck. Hope borrowed my car. I could never ask Clark to drive me home in this weather. He would. I know he would. But I couldn't ask him to do that. I might be willing to take a risk, but I don't want to include him in the equation. I would never let something happen to Clark. I pull on the ends of my sweater, then cross my arms over my chest. We really are here together for the night. Me and Clark. Clark and me. What should feel like a dream feels like a nightmare. After a few more minutes of self-doubt, I finally come out of my hiding place. I can't stay in this room all night. At some point, I'll need food, to brush my teeth, whatever. By the time I make it to the kitchen, Clark has already showered, changed into a dashing sweater, put a kettle on the stove, and started whisking something in a bowl. He's whisking? I stand in the doorway and watch him for a moment, taking in the sight that is uniquely him. How can someone look just as good in clothes as they do out of them? How can mixing something in a bowl look sexy? How does just looking at him make my stomach flutter? Okay, there are worse ways to spend the night. I reach up and hold my heart-shaped locket for a moment. Clark must feel my eyes on him. He looks up from the task at hand and smiles widely at me. I thought we could do breakfast for dinner. How does a cheese omelet sound? I release my locket and exhale. Perfect, I answer, not sure if I'm talking about the food or the man in front of me, who also looks good enough to eat. One night. I can make it one night, right? Clark. I tried to look nice for her, my usual sweatpants and pajama bottoms be damned. 
Dressing up to spend the night in seems nuts. But for Natalie, I do just about anything. If she wanted me to wear a tuxedo to watch TV, I would. I know she's upstairs trying to decide what to do next. The harder the snow falls, the more I believe in fate. She's not going anywhere tonight. When I hear the bottom stair squeak, I feel my entire face break out into a smile. A small victory. I don't want to appear too eager and scare her away. I suppress every instinct to run over to Natalie the moment she descends the stairs and scoop her up into my arms. Instead, I pretend to be busy whisking the eggs. I want her to come to me. Plus, I know she loves baking shows. She can name the winner from each season of The Great British Bake Off. Maybe if I can embody things she likes, those feelings will transfer to me. When I finally look up from the cooking task at hand, I find Natalie watching me with soft eyes. I wait for her to say something, but she doesn't. Her introvert side is showing. Offering her the most comforting smile I can muster, I say, I thought we could do breakfast for dinner. How does a cheese omelet sound? Holding my gaze, she responds, Perfect. I resist the urge to fist pump the air. Natalie opens her mouth, then closes it. She is so used to being busy, she doesn't know how to stand still. I hide my smirk. Natalie takes another step into the kitchen, as if trying to decide where to go or what to do next. Do you need any help? Someone to wash dishes or... Pouring the eggs into the pan, I shake my head, cutting her off. Nope, I'm all good. Just relax. Help yourself to a cup of tea. I know my girl. I left the sugar and half and half on the kitchen table, knowing she would need them. Flipping the omelet in the pan, I enjoy the comfortable silence falling between us. Me cooking and Natalie sipping her tea. Something so simple feels so right. I hope Natalie realizes this too. Chapter 5 Clark Over dinner, Natalie tells me all about her family and the craziness going on under one roof. I don't blame her for wanting to take some time away. Personally, I'd have pitched a tent in the backyard despite the cold weather, or looked up local Airbnb rentals for the visiting family members, and then left the printouts in some not-so-subtle places. Natalie leans forward with a mischievous smile on her face, about to say something else, when everything goes black. Uh-oh, this can't be good. Natalie? I ask. I'm right here, she answers. Instinctually, I reach forward and take her right hand in mine. I feel her stiffen for the slightest of seconds, surprised by the action. Holding my breath, I wait for her to say or do something. Take her hand away. Tell me she's fine. About to remove my hand, Natalie surprises me by covering the top of my hand with her left hand one. I like this. I like this a lot. Breaking the silence, I say, there are usually a couple of candles in the middle cabinet. Even though I can't see Natalie in the dark, I know she's nodding in agreement. We stand from the table at the same time, Natalie still holding my hand. I take the opportunity to intertwine my fingers with hers. Her hand feels small and delicate in my own. I tighten my grip, wanting to protect Natalie during the blackout. With ease, Natalie lets me guide her toward the cabinets. When I stop, she bumps right into me. Sorry, she half shrieks. I want to say I'm not, but I resist. Instead, I go with no problem. Using just my left hand, I remove the candles one at a time and eventually feel my way to a lighter. Two hands would have been easier. 
but I wasn't ready to let Natalie go. Lighting the first candle, I hand it to Natalie. Steering the lighter toward the second candle, I pause. Natalie is a breath away. Everything I've ever wanted is right here. Her brown eyes look to the floor, then back at me. The candlelight dances around her face, highlighting one beautiful feature at a time. Tucking a loose strand of hair behind Natalie's ear with one hand, I take the candle from her with the other. I place the candle on the countertop so that my hands are free to touch Natalie. Her shoulders, her neck, her face. Closing the remaining distance between us, I cover her lips with mine. Time stops. Her lips are soft, welcoming, and way, way better than I imagined. Nothing else exists but the two of us right here, right now. Perfection. Natalie hesitantly breaks the kiss and looks up at me for answers. I surprised her. Her bee-stung lips look well-loved and in need of some more attention. I resist going in for another kiss. Instead, I tell her the truth. I've wanted to do that for the longest time. Really? She asks, clearly not aware of my feelings. Really, I answer. Tentatively, Natalie initiates a second kiss. Her lips graze mine and linger a hair away, sharing the same air, before her lips overtake mine. I wholeheartedly accept her kiss. I wrap my arms all the way around her and pull her body flush against mine. I want each kiss to be better than the last. I try to tell her how I feel through the kiss. We stand there exploring one another for what could be minutes or hours. I've lost all track of time. We only stop kissing when the candle's flame vanishes. I go to light the second candle, not wanting to end the moment, but Natalie takes hold of my hand. Using her cell phone as a flashlight, Natalie turns to leave the kitchen. I follow, keeping her hand in mine as we ascend the stairs. It looks like I'm not sleeping on the couch after all. Chapter 6 Natalie Clark and I go out into the yard and have a snowball fight. Between soft kisses and snow angels, I laugh and smile until my sides hurt. Then we head back inside and without much delay, we make love. When the clothing started coming off from the snow, it was the logical thing to do, to restore body heat. Once we were warmed up from our physical activity, we steamed up the shower. After that, we started watching a movie on Netflix. Well, a few minutes of a movie. Before long, we were kissing. His tongue traced my bottom lip. Then the kissing deepened. And soon the clothes were off again. We decorated a Christmas wreath, then made love. We drank hot chocolate, then made love. We fell asleep next to one another, woke up in each other's arms, then made love. My body felt both sated and exhausted. I'm going to have to rest after this vacation and give my lady bits time off from Clark's loving. Snuggling up to Clark, my heart has never felt so full and content. Clark wraps his arms all the way around me, pulling me further into his perfect warmth. It's as if he doesn't want a millimeter of space between us. I nestle my head underneath his chin until I find the perfect nook between his neck and shoulder. Inhaling deeply, I immerse myself in his scent, wanting to be entirely surrounded by him. Hints of cologne linger on Clark's skin. On my next inhale, I realize it's the same fragrance I bought for him two Christmases ago. Even when I wasn't physically with him, I was with him in the ways that mattered the most. 
I don't know if I've ever felt more content in my entire life. Clark kisses the top of my head and adjusts himself ever so slightly, bringing his mouth closer to my ear. Running his right hand up and down my body in a soothing motion, Clark clears his throat. I smile to myself, knowing that sound. Clark wants to tell me something, and he's trying to figure out the best way to word his thought. Since Clark can tell me anything, and he knows that, this sentence is going to be an important one. My stomach decides to embrace the excitement, herding butterflies, while my chest constricts with nerves. I need to know what he's thinking. Clark's hand pauses in the middle of my back. Placing a hint of pressure, he pulls me in even closer, as if it were possible to fuse his body to mine. His lips caress the top of my ear before saying, You only get one soulmate in life, and I knew you were mine. Somehow that statement sounds so much more intense than I love you. I love yous can come and go. You can have relationships that result in I love yous being exchanged, but fizzle out. Soulmates are one and done. I shift, not leaving Clark's embrace, but adjusting within it until I can lock eyes with him. I want him to see my love and know how much he means to me. Does that mean my soul makes yours complete? Without hesitation, Clark answers, Absolutely. I kiss his jaw, unable to reach his lips from my position. (laughs) Good, because if there is such a thing as soulmates, I've known you were mine since we were five years old. As much as I don't want to leave Clark's embrace, I take comfort in the fact that I can cuddle with him again after we talk. I push myself up into a sitting position, causing the blanket to pool around my waist. Clark's eyes instantly go to my breasts. I love knowing I can turn him on. After everything we've said and done, I'm realizing I love having his eyes on me. However, I want him to focus on what I'm about to say. Pulling the blanket up, I cover myself, forcing Clark's gaze to return to my face. I'll let the blanket fall back down after we talk. Reaching behind my neck, I unclasp the chain holding my locket in place. My grandmother gave me this locket for my 13th birthday. When I opened my gift, she said, The best use for a locket is to bring love with you wherever you go. It didn't take me long to think of the perfect photo to insert. I hand the locket to Clark. He doesn't miss the opportunity to brush his fingers over mine. After a moment of affection, he takes the locket. It doesn't open right away, clearly used to being closed. With a soft click, Clark opens the locket and sees what I kept by my heart all these years. A moment passes, then another. My confidence wanes. I thought about including a photo of just you or my five-year-old school photo on the left and yours on the right, but I didn't want to be weird. I figured if the locket ever fell off and got lost or one of my sisters got hold of it, I could say it was a photo of my best friend's. A week after my grandmother gave me my birthday present, I printed out a photo of Hope, Clark, and myself. I had already marked it as a favorite in my phone and printed out a copy for my desk. In the photo, I was 13, Hope was 12, and Clark was 14. The three of us were all smiling at the camera like we were having the best time in the world, and on that day, we were. That October, the Millers had taken the three of us to the Topsfield Fair. Hope and I were going to see the animals, play games, and explore the autumn fun. I had been craving a caramel apple for weeks, and Hope wanted to try pumpkin donuts. When we were settled in the car, Clark surprised everyone and got in the back seat with us. Mrs. Miller asked Clark about his plans. Casually, Clark said he was meeting up with some friends. 
As soon as we arrived, Clark pulled out his phone and said his friends had decided to go to the movies and blow off the fare. Mr. Miller offered to drive him to the theater, but Clark declined. Instead, he spent the entire day with me and Hope. Mr. and Mrs. Miller went off on their own, leaving us to our own devices. We ate chocolate-covered marshmallows, successfully tossed rings around bottles winning stuffed animals, went on rides, drank apple cider, and smiled the entire time. It was one of the best days of my life. I loved spending time with my best friend and my crush. The booth we each won at was run by a husband and wife team. The husband didn't look too thrilled with us, but the wife was all smiles. She offered to take our photo. I think she wanted to rub salt in her husband's wound a little, her way of saying, let the kids have their fun. Naturally, I handed her my cell phone, wanting to document what was turning out to be the best day in my young life. Hope went to stand between me and her brother, but Clark managed to wrap an arm around my shoulders, then hers, maneuvering us how he wanted. He muttered, the tallest goes in the middle. And that was that. I knew before I saw the photo, I loved it. To this day, I still have my prize, a small stuffed Dalmatian that lives on top of my dresser. His eyes look suspiciously moist. I never had plans. What? Clearing his throat with a forced cough, Clark finally looks up from the locket. The day we all went to the fair. I wasn't thrilled to spend the day with my little sister, but I couldn't have been more excited to be with you. I told my mother I was going to some action movie, but I never had plans to meet up with anyone else. I was always going to spend the day at the fair with you. I can't believe it. You lied? Clark gives me a grin that encompasses all the things. Smugness for fooling me, shyness at coming clean, and love for me. For you? I'd do anything. My incredibly sexy soulmate rises from the bed and fishes something out of his bag. I'm not too concerned with what he's looking for, I'm too busy enjoying the magnificent view. When he finds what he's looking for, Clark catches my gaze and smiles. Coming back to bed, Clark hands me a small box that is maybe three inches by three inches. It's wrapped in faded red tissue paper. I take the gift box from Clark and wait for him to say something. All he does is nudge my right hand as if to say, open it. The age of the paper is still a mystery, but I rip into it. I've never been one to open presents carefully so that I can keep the wrapping paper. With the paper gone, I hold a small white gift box. It's the kind of fancy jewelry stores use when ringing up a sale. Suddenly, my heart feels about 20 pounds heavier. He didn't buy what I think he did. Did he? That would be crazy. Certifiable. I look over at Clark, who refuses to meet my eyes. His focuses on the box. Inhaling deeply, attempting to calm my growing nerves, I remove the top. Sitting on a small satin pillow rests a gold turtle dove charm. It takes my breath away. The detailing is exquisite. I can make out each feather in the delicate wings, and the eye comes alive as an emerald gem. Clark reaches into the box and picks it up. I bought that for you five years ago. Looking in the box, I realize it isn't a satin pillow for display purposes, but a tiny gift bag. As gently as I can, I take the small bag out of the box. Gently, I undo the laces and tilt the bag towards my palm. The most beautiful gift reveals itself. The turtle dove charm needs a bracelet to call home. Clark had purchased a simple but classic gold charm bracelet that I could add to over the years. 
Except the bracelet isn't entirely empty. There are already two charms dangling from the bracelet. The first charm looks like a chocolate chip cookie. There is a single bite in the circle, and tiny black gems look like chocolate chips. The charm next to the cookie is a perfectly shaped heart. It's the same color gold as the bracelet and turtle dove. You and Natalie were the two turtle doves for the Christmas pageant. Then you made a big fuss that Home Alone 2 was better than the original. Between those two things, I had to buy the turtle dove for you. Handing me the charm, I brush Clark's palm with my fingers as I take the turtle dove from him. I add it to the bracelet, right next to the heart. Kissing my temple, Clark adds, The other charm seemed obvious. I tilt the chocolate chip cookie charm towards the light to get a better look at it. I can't look at a cookie without thinking of you. Clark tosses his head back and laughs. laughs. Same. But in all honesty, most things make me think of you. Draping the charm bracelet around my left wrist, I hold the ends together and gesture for Clark to clasp it for me. It takes his large fingers a couple of tries before he manages to get it right. When he does, I hold my left arm up for his inspection. The charms dangle in a way that seems meant to be. Clark closes the distance between us, taking my lips in a passionate kiss. Everything is out in the open. There aren't any more secrets or unsaid words. We are finally on the same page together. I can live my life with Clark by my side, enjoying chocolate chip cookies, having snowball fights, and wake up every morning wearing the most thoughtful charm bracelet. No matter what is going on, I can look at my gift and know how much I'm loved. I break the kiss so that I can speak. Thank you for my gift. I love it more than I can ever say. Clark's muscular chest moves up and down as he breathes. His eyes heat, and I recognize that look. Clark spends the rest of the night showing me just how much he loves me. Chapter 7 Clark I glance towards the window and notice the blue sky. The snow is finally passed. I kiss the top of Natalie's head and pull her closer. During the night, the blanket must have fallen to the middle of her back. Wanting her to be as comfortable as possible, I tuck the edges around her shoulders. Natalie snuggles closer and grumbles, What time is it? into my side. The analog clock still hangs next to the door. Squinting a little, I make out the numbers. It's almost 11.30. Natalie jolts awake. We have to get up. I prop myself up on the pillow and lean back to enjoy the blanket-free view. Why? Natalie hurriedly throws on the first pieces of clothing she stumbles across. Hope will be home any minute. I don't want to tell her about the two of us by showing her the two of us. Thank you very much. The front door squeaks open, followed by keys landing in the glass bowl near the door. Hello, hello, Hope sings in a cheery voice. Natalie's managed to put an outfit together, but I think she looks different. Her hair is still all over the place, her cheeks look flushed, and her lips look slightly larger from all the kissing. Hope might not be a professional sleuther, but she's no dummy either. I have nothing to hide. The last few days have been the best of my life. I know Hope won't miss the smile I'm wearing. Natalie makes a beeline for the door, but I catch her around the waist. Before she can get a word out, I smother her anxieties with a kiss. After a moment, I feel her relax under my caress. Those two tight shoulders lower and her eyes soften. I love you. Natalie places her hands on my chest before going on her tiptoes to brush her nose against mine. Good. I love you too. 
I love that Natalie's tall enough to do that. I rest my forehead against hers. Hope just wants you to be happy. Our relationship has nothing to do with her. She has her own happily ever after. Nothing she says will get in the way of ours. Natalie lets out a gentle laugh. (laughs) You're talking like a romance novel hero. I shrug. Romance novel or spy thriller? As long as I'm your hero, that's all that matters. With that, I give Natalie another quick kiss and start to get dressed. When I come downstairs, Hope already looks a little perplexed. What did I miss? Natalie opens her mouth, but abruptly closes it. Hope looks from Natalie to me, then back again. Her entire face breaks out into a smile. Thank God! Natalie looks at me, but I'm just as confused. I thought the two of you were never going to get together. Natalie, you knew I had a crush on Clark? Hope walks over to the couch and plops down. Of course, you aren't exactly Meryl Streep. Your eyes always brightened when Clark entered the room. He would say something to you, and it was like no one else in the room existed. Besides, you always wore your best outfits whenever you knew he was going to be around. You never missed a chance to say hi to him or run into him. I nudge Natalie with my arm jokingly. Did you dress up for me? Despite everything, my girl still blushes. That's a big fat yes. Not missing her chance, Hope continues. And you, she says, pointing to me. You look at Natalie like she hung the moon, named the stars, and discovered the sun. Natalie sits down next to Hope. Does he really look at me like that? Hope takes a candy cane out of her purse and starts unwrapping it. That's underselling it. He's like that heart eyes emoji with hearts dancing around his head as Lionel Richie plays in the background. I shrug at Hope's description. Well, I do love her. That pink blush pops up on Natalie's cheeks again. Hope looks over at me, mid candy cane lick. You two love each other? Now I'm the one who's confused. I thought you knew that. Hope drops the candy cane on the coffee table. I knew you liked each other. I didn't know it was love. She pulls Natalie in for a hug. That means if you get married, we'll be sisters. Hope starts rambling. I mean, I already think of you as a sister, but now it will be official. Did he say anything about marriage? Wait, don't tell me. No, tell me. Eek. Never mind. I don't want to know what you two talk about. I walk away from the pair as Hope continues to talk at Natalie. I think by the time they're done talking, Natalie could use a batch of home-baked chocolate chip cookies. I start preheating the oven and get the ingredients ready. After all, chocolate chip cookies are always a good idea. This has been New You Were Mine by Angela Maria Hart. Read for you by Lou Banks. Welcome back. Welcome back, lady listeners. Thank you so, so much to Angela Marie Hart for giving us New You Were Mine. You are the sweetest. She is so generous. Um, if you are in the Read Me Romance headquarters group, she is the one that makes like the plaques and all the Read Me Romance decor and stuff that we give out all the time that we put in our book boxes. Um, if you order paperbacks from us, I usually slip some of her bookmarks down in there too, or her stickers and magnets and stuff that she sends. She has got the biggest, most generous spirit. And I'm just so glad that we've had her on the podcast. She's fantastic. So thank you so much, Angela, for being with us. Um, Stick around with us for next week. We've got two weeks left um, until the end of the year. We've got Katie Wilde next week with the Stone Hard Bride, which I am so excited. Those covers are gorgeous. Um, after, 
Oh my God. Well, and all of her covers are so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so after Katie Wilde, we have us stalking the secret baby, <laughs> which is our ridiculous troping book. And then we're probably going to throw out a, um, a book during Christmas, like that next week. That's we're on break until February 7th. Cause we were, so. we were literally talking about, cause the book she just found that she's going to try to read, which is only on Kobo to get the ebook. Yeah. The, the, book, um, the, the mystery book that I, the one I want to read is only on Kobo. It's and only audio. on Kobo. Yeah. Unless you would get the paperback from Amazon. But, mm -hmm. um, we were talking about books that we like that are like three to five hours long in audio during Christmas. That's holiday. And that's what, uh, that are that's, perfect. That's fuzzy. And that's why we're like, let's do one of ours so that mm -hmm. people have that. Because we always, I know I seek that out every year, a couple that I'll listen to why I'm doing Christmas errands. Or Short wrapping Christmas them. audio book. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's what we're going to put Toasty up um, the week of Christmas, I guess. They're Christmas on Sunday, so it'll come out like that Monday, Tuesday. But we're just going to drop the whole thing. It's not going to be a full episode. It's just an intro, and then we'll tell you where to get everything and then play the whole book so you can listen to something fun. Yeah, and one click. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, I think that's everything. That's tell so much. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance, read, read me romance, read me romance, read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine, or you could sit back, relax, and unwind and read me romance, read, read me romance.